So welcome everybody. My name is Renee Allen. I am chair of the Town of Exeter Energy Committee and thank you for attending our educational event tonight. Usually we do this in person. We do it down at the Exeter Library and the guys are there and we bring in the candy and the water, but here we are all in line again. <clears throat> um, a quick announcement uh, from the Energy Committee is that uh, this week is also National Drive Electric Week and Amy Farnham, who is a presenter tonight and myself, uh, shot a quick video, which will be shown on Friday and Saturday um, uh, about EVs. And we have kind of a local celebrity, Al Lambert from Al's Automotive, showing us his Tesla S. And it's kind of an interesting video and it gives you the stats of how many people have electric cars in Exeter and, <clears throat> and in the state and things like that. So you can get the link or you can watch it, I think on Exeter TV, the Exeter TV Facebook and the Exeter TV YouTube. That's where it will be housed. We had a couple more attendees come in. Let's see, Richard and Beverly. Oh, hello, Beverly. Um, okay, so tonight, thank you for coming to the NH Saves event. This is sponsored by NH Saves and the presenters tonight are the professionals, Andy Duncan and Ted Stiles, as well as Amy Farnham of our own energy committee will be speaking about heat pumps. Uh, what we're gonna do tonight is we're gonna do about a 50 minute presentation and then we're gonna have 20 minutes for Q&A at the end. And hopefully you um, understand how to use the raise your hand button or type in your questions. I have the, the question, the discussion question and answer panel open and I'll try to, um, to pass you in if you have a question midstream. Okay, so that's all I have. I'm Renee and I'm gonna pass it over to, I think Andy is gonna start. So. No, Ted's gonna start. Oh, Ted's gonna start. Okay, here's Ted. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to everybody. I'm gonna share my screen here in just a second. I believe we... We've got that going and we can start here with the first slide. So again, welcome. Thank you for attending. We hope you get a lot out of this tonight. Uh, Andy and I are going to be doing, you know, a little bit of an abbreviated version of the uh, longer button up that we we're used to doing. Um, we use, usually do them by ourselves, but just recently we teamed up and now we're doing sort of a collaborative where we're going to hand off a few times back and forth. Um, the New Hampshire says button up program is sponsored by the utilities and they are all listed there. And they help put this together. This is a little bit of an overview of kind of the, the main topics we're going to go over. Um, you know, if you have some questions, you know, feel free to ask, but um, I'd say chances are we're probably going to cover your question um, anyway in our presentation. And of course, there's going to be a QA and a at the end, so we can always um, fill in back at the end there too. little bit about how I got into this. I was a school teacher for about 20 or 25 years and then I saw a bumper sticker one day that really started making me think that, um, you know, I was transitioning into a new career, into some kind of um, something with to do with energy. Um, and, you know, the answer to this question to me is not solar and it's not wind, it's not hydro or any of those things. I think those are great. Um, you know, they're great ways of producing energy. Uh, they're certainly much, much better than fossil fuels. Um, but there's always a, you know, a, a downside to every fuel source that you use to make energy um, or maybe an environmental impact or, uh, you know, a negative or disadvantage. Um, and really, to me, the answer to this question is the energy that you don't use. That's the greenest thing you could possibly do. Um, so lowering it, your energy that you use, whether it's in your driving or in your home or in your business or in your lifestyle or in your food, um, that's really um, where it's at. There's not much you can say to argue against uh, that. So I got involved in, uh, you know, helping people reduce their energy. We're going to talk kind of first about electric because that's typically something that everybody has in their home, uh, you know, unless they're off grid or something, everybody has an electric bill. Um, this is just kind of a general list of all the different major uses in your house. Um, you know, again, this is a, a an average, so your house might be different than this, of course. Um, and it's listed from sort of generally speaking, the higher at the top um, to lower usage at the bottom, but they're also listed in terms of potential for energy savings. So for instance, lighting, typically most homes is not the, the biggest energy use in terms of electricity, but it is the one that really is low hanging fruit and it's very, very easy to you know, reduce your energy bill by um, changing your lighting. You know, it's very inexpensive. Um, 
electric hot water actually is the biggest for most people's houses if you have an electric hot water heater again it's uh you know, this is like an average and you can see, see some of those other items that that you know working their way down there so it's good to kind of know like, you know which things in your house you know tend to use the most and uh which things don't you know of course this could be different if you have a really really super old appliance um, versus a new one that could always change it but this is just kind of a general trend if you're interested in trying to do some more um, sleuthing and figuring out, you know, where is your electricity going or where is it, what's it going to, a um, couple different ways of doing it. One is you can go to your library and you can borrow one of these kilowatts. It's a small little device that plugs into the wall. And then you can take anything that you plug into the wall normally and plug it into this thing instead. What it'll do is it'll calculate up the energy usage for you. Uh, it takes a little bit of math. But you can basically figure out, you know, how much does my TV cost me a month or how much does, um, you know, the toaster cost per week or even per day, depending on how long you use this thing. Another cool thing that's come out really just in the last few years is, is the ability to do this pretty cheaply from uh, the whole house all at once. So there are some systems, they're called um, whole house electrical monitors. Um, Sense is one of the ones that, that I'm most familiar with. This little screenshot here is uh, someone's phone. So they're at work and they can look and see, oh yeah, the microwave's on right now. It's kind of good if you want to spy on your kids too. If you have kids at home, you can say, oh geez, the, uh, you know, the garage door just opened. Oh, it just opened again. What's going on in the garage? Um, so th this is actually will um, be something that's on your, um, your electric meter and it's measuring everything all at once in totality, but it also can do it you know, by circuit or even down to the, uh, by the appliance. And you can see what it's doing in real time. You can see how it's doing over time too. Really, really neat, um, especially for people who have sort of mysterious um, high electrical loads that they can't figure out, right? If you've already done LED lights and you've already done a new refrigerator, et cetera, et cetera, and you still have, you know, what you think is too high of an electric load, this can be a really good way of um, getting at that. This seems really kind of silly to put in here, um, you know, because we're all adults, we're all interested in saving energy, but um, you'd be amazed at how many times, um, hey, I forgot to mention, I am a professional energy auditor, so I'm, you know, in people's houses several days a week, you know, all around the state. And I'm, it's amazing sometimes that I'll, I'll be in a house for, say, two hours. And while I'm there, I think, well, there must be a lot of people home because I hear a TV in one room and then the other room has a, a, a computers running. And then the other room, there's a radio running um, in the kitchen. There's another TV running. And then I look outside and the homeowners in the backyard, you know, gardening or weeding or something. So. Even people who you know are ostensibly interested in energy saving, um, sometimes are you know you develop bad habits of leaving things on. So it's really important just to kind of you know be aware of that, and um, you can really have a big effect impact just by being a little bit more conscious of this this type of thing. There are some things in your house that, uh, believe it or not, are on all the time. We call these energy drips or phantoms or vampire loads. There's a few different names they go by, but Basically, you know, a lot, a lot of the things when you hit off, it actually is off. But there's a lot of things when you hit the OFF off button, it's still not actually off. It's still using a little bit of electricity. It's not a huge amount, but if you get enough of these in your house, it can add up, you know, and every little bit adds up. Some of these things might include anything that has like a charger built into it or a black box. Um, you might feel that thing getting hot, even if there's nothing plugged into it. Things that have clocks, things that have remote controls, like TVs and stuff like that. Excuse me, that's my dog barking, sorry. Um, anything with a small light, um, DDRs and things like that, those all are using a little bit of power even though you think they're off. Here's a couple of examples of some things that uh, are used power. One of the interesting things I thought was the Apple TV. The first generation Apple TV, when you were watching it, used 21 watts, and when you didn't use it, it only dropped to 17. You know, not zero like most people thought. So the way to do this, uh, to, to handle this kind of situation is to use one of these smart power strips. So if you plug in some of these devices into this part, smart power strip, then you can actually shut off um, the whole entire thing for real. Um, so it really is not using any power at that point. And you can do it individually. So you can, um, you can have your, say your monitor on your, your computer on, but not your speakers or not your printer and that kind of thing. So you can kind of control things you know, a little bit more independently there. LED lighting has uh, really come a long way. Um, a lot of times people think I'm gonna talk about CFL lighting and they think about the one, you know, has mercury or it flickers, it takes forever to warm up and 
that's sort of the older technology. LEDs don't do any of that. Um, they come on right off the bat. Um, they look really good. They use very, very little energy. A lot of times I'll be putting in, you know, seven or eight um, light bulbs in someone's kitchen. Each bulb is only using eight or nine watts. So it, all of them together don't even use the electricity that one of these bulbs that I took out is using. So it's really amazing um, what they're able to get out of this technology. Um, for a while, it was kind of hard to get different styles of bulbs. Now you can get candelabras and you can get globes and you can get ornamental ones and recessed lights of different sizes. Um, you want to make sure you get it, you know, the right one. If you have a dimmer switch, you want to get one that's good for dimmers. Um, one thing I would warn you is um, don't be fooled into the one that says daylight, unless you're the, the oddball person who, who might actually like this. Um, daylight's nice when you're outside, but uh, most people go into the store for an LED bulb and they see, oh, the, the daylight one, I want that one. It just sounds nice. Um, but when they screw it in, it's like, it's sort of like that bluish tint one you see at the bottom there. It's more like uh, sitting in a dentist chair, I think, or in, in a classroom or a biology lab. Really not the, the, what most people like. So we're, what you're probably looking for is a warm white or um, they, they also rate it in Kelvin. So if you look for 2,700 Kelvin, most likely that's gonna be the style that you're looking for in terms of the, the hue. A couple other real simple low hanging fruit that you can do um, to save on your electricity or possibly some other um, fuel, depending on how you make your hot water is a low flow shower head, right? Most people are a little afraid of those because they think it's just gonna be a little dribble of water, but um, Believe it or not, most people don't even notice a difference. And uh, some people actually report that they feel like there's more water pressure uh, with a low flow shower head than they had with their old one. Um, insulating all your heat pipes is something that's real low hanging fruit because the uh, material to do it is very, very inexpensive and it's uh, easy to do yourself. It's a good do it yourself project. And of course, as we mentioned, you know, smart strips and um, there's a lot of new technology with plugs and hubs and things like that too. So those are some ways that you can just right off the bat, you know, reduce some of your energy usage. Um, if you're looking to get a new uh, appliance, you know, you definitely want to be looking for the Energy Star label. Uh, we don't recommend you go out and replace all your appliances right now with Energy Star appliances, but um, when they do start to need to be replaced, this is the time to do it. Um, there's some really good rebates for all these things that you see listed here. Uh, the refrigerator one is actually really popular because they will haul away your old refrigerator and recycle it. Sometimes that's um, can be difficult to do if you're doing it on your own. You can go to the website here to get some more information about that. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Andy's going to start sharing his screen and we are going to uh, move into staying warm in your home. And now might be a good time if people have any questions uh, associated with the slides that uh, Ted was just showing while we're kind of in transition here. There was one question um, for Ted, and this is just random. This is from Richard. What kind of dog do you have, Ted? <laughs> uh, he's just like a brown hound dog. Looks sort of like a Rhodesian Ridgeback kind of thing. <laughs> okay. He, he heard the train go by, I think, and uh, he doesn't like the train. <laughs> All right. This should look pretty similar to... Um, what you just saw with Ted. So hopefully everything looks fine with the slides. Is that right? It's good to me. Okay. Um, so yeah, kind of going into another section here and I kind of think about today and the weather we've had, uh, seems like summer and winter have been sort of fighting each other past uh, day or so. Um, finally got a little bit of rain, which was great, um, but definitely gonna be a lot cooler tonight than it was last night. And so, Good time to be thinking about how to keep houses warm in the winter time because we're definitely going into that season. Um, and, you know, and the general idea here is that heat always moves from kind of warmer surfaces, warmer areas to colder areas, and you want to keep that warmth inside a house uh, in the winter time. And not going into a lot of depth here about building science, but just the a couple concepts and that is that heat can move in, a, in three different ways and one is through conduction and that's through materials so like that poker in the fire moving through that metal and then convection think of that in terms of like air currents and we'll talk about air leakage associated with convection and then radiation uh, it's, it's sort of that idea if you know you had a bonfire on a fall fall night and uh, 
feeling warm in front from the fire, but kind of cold on the backside. It's the, the heat that's radiating from a hot source. And really, it's not Three Mile Island or anything like that. Um, it's more um, basically sources of heat where you feel that radiation, wood stove or the sun, uh, something like that. And we're not going to talk a whole lot about um, keeping houses cool in the summertime, but one tip along those lines is the fact that houses heat up in the summer in, in large part because of sunlight and sun hitting surfaces and warming those up and those like re-radiating. So the more that you can shade your house, you know, you can even get like um, roof shingles that are more reflective rather than absorbent of the sun's uh, radiation. So there's a lot of things like that. Trees, you know, particularly the trees that have the leaves in the summer and lose their leaves around this time of year can make a really big difference in keeping a house cool in the summertime. So kind of moving into that conduction side of things, the, essentially the opposite of conduction is insulation. And the way that we typically measure insulation is in R values. And so essentially the higher the R value, the better. And uh, a lot of these um, common insulation types that are here are measured in an R value per inch. So fiberglass, cellulose, fairly similar, you know, R three point something per inch. Different types of foam boards might be R4, or R5, or R7 per inch. Spray foam is one of the better insulating materials that also air seals. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but I just want to point out that a typical double pane window, um, you might get some that are a little bit better than an R3, but R4 is a very good insulating uh, window. R5 is a pretty unusual window in terms of its insulating ability. And you can go a little bit higher than that, but it gets really high end. So that's like the whole window is R3, R4 or so. And we're talking about R4, R3 and a half per inch for insulating materials. So for most houses, um, particularly at nighttime or when the sun's not shining in the winter, it's, uh, those windows are basically going to be weak links in your kind of insulating shell, your envelope. And um, they're, they're not going to help in terms of keeping that warmth in. Uh, they're going to be conducting more heat out. And the same sort of concept with wood. You know, typically a framed house, the wood is more of a thermal break rather than an insulator because uh, with an R value of around 1.3 per inch, it's just not as good, uh, say a two by six wall, as the insulation that's right next to it. Uh, and then probably one of the worst insulators in a typical house is the basement wall. And that uh, includes things like concrete, it might be brick, it might be stone, any sort of masonry materials. About an R1 for eight inches of concrete, so very poor insulator. And people think, well, I don't need to insulate my basement walls because, you know, I don't live down in my basement and it seems pretty warm down there. Well, basements are pretty thermally connected to the rest of the house. And so it could be one of the most important things that you need to do in terms of insulation is insulating that basement wall, particularly where it's exposed to outside or the first foot, feet or a couple feet of uh, ground contact. And so, you know, we talk about R values and they're important, but it is really important to be thinking about R values, not just in terms of like what the label says, but also how well installed it is. And so here's just some numbers to throw at you in terms of different R values for um, a new house built according to the energy code. And um, Renee and Amy, that might be an interesting, you know, uh, activity is sort of encouraging, making sure that builders are, are building the energy code. You probably got an inspector in town, code inspector who's doing all that. Um, and, and that's really important. As you can see, a lot of houses uh, that are existing are not nearly as good in terms of a house built to this newer energy code. Um, but I want to point out this graphic in the lower right and just kind of imagine that's like your attic and you're kind of staring down bird's eye view of the attic and all the white is insulation, maybe about 12 inches of it, R38. So a fair amount of insulation, you know, that's, that's a pretty big insulating layer. 
And then there's a couple of cracks, a couple of areas of missing insulation. Um, and we're going to say that only about 5% of the surface area has missing insulation where you could see down to like the drywall of that uh, ceiling. And uh, the question for you is, um, what's the average R value in a situation like that? So 95% is R38 and 5% is about R1, pretty low insulating value. Um, it's a little bit of a trick question. The first uh, time I saw a question like this, I thought, yeah, you know, maybe around R30 or something like that. I was kind of thinking about averaging those values. You can't really, physics doesn't allow you to average R values. That, that 5% that is R1 is having a really a disproportionate effect on the total heat loss conductive heat loss uh, in that attic. So the average R value in that scenario is about R13. So you can make a huge difference just by covering up that 5% that's uninsulated. And, and so it's something to think about in terms of whether you're getting a professional or whether it's do it yourself kind of activities. It's just doing a really good job or having a really good job done of uh, the installation work. And um, time to move to the next slide. So in addition to just uh, poor install jobs, there's other kind of defects that can happen with insulation. So you can have incomplete insulation where the builder contractor just might have missed something. And so that's what you're seeing in the picture on the left there. If you look at the um, the area that is kind of above where the metal ductwork is, it's kind of highlighted uh, reddish. That is an area that should be insulated, but it isn't. And the builder just, just missed it. And you think, oh, you know, that's really uncommon. Well, it's more common than you might think. Um, and then the example over on the right is a pretty good insulation job, but the only problem is, is that they're insulating from outside to outside. Um, because that louvered gable end vent is essentially like an open window up in the attic area. So it's, a, it's bringing in all that cold air in the wintertime, and so the insulation is really not doing any good. So that's an example of misaligned insulation. Okay, is there a question? Uh, insulation on basement floor? Um, it's interesting. We don't tend to recommend insulation on basement floors a whole lot um, just because if a basement, let's say it's like three or four feet below grade, um, then it's in ground contact with, you know, roughly speaking about 50 degree uh, ground temperature as opposed to um, a wall where a good chunk of that wall either could be above grade so it's in contact with the air that's quite cold in the wintertime, or it could be in contact with frozen ground the first foot or so, first foot or two. And so that is a lot more heat loss associated with that bigger temperature difference um, compared to the floor. But it can make a difference. And then certainly if you've got a situation where what we call a slab on grade, then, um, then you have, can have potential for an awful lot of heat loss coming out of that slab that's basically at the same surface as the ground. So I wanna move from um, that conductive heat loss and countering that with insulation to the convective heat loss. And essentially it's the convective currents that happen in the house, very subtle, not real noticeable. Um, something you're not gonna be able to measure without specialized tools, uh, that it can cause quite a lot of heat loss. It can be as much, if not more, of heat loss as heat loss from lack of uh, insulation. And so people think um, heat rises. Well, if you're thinking about conductive heat loss, heat can really move in any direction. So that basement floor is a good example. You know, heat moving down it can go sideways, it can go up. Um, but warm air is a bit more buoyant than cold air. So there is some truth to that concept of heat rises when you're thinking about air, sort of like that hot air balloon effect. And so what's typically happening in a house in the wintertime is that there's just these small 
cracks. We're talking about eighth of an inch cracks, quarter inch cracks. Uh, could be bigger than that, but oftentimes, you know, pretty subtle, not real noticeable. Might be around your attic hatch or things like that. Um, and there's slight pressure differences that allow that buoyant warm air that's under a little bit more pressure than the outside or attic air around it for that air to escape. And then to kind of make up for the air that's escaping, the warm air that's escaping, um, there's cold air coming in down below. Uh, and that's a lot more noticeable for people. If you go to a basement in the wintertime, you might notice places where there's cold air coming in. It's a lot harder to notice the warm air escaping uh, above, uh, out, out the kind of the top floor, top heated floor of your house. And then just to, to keep in mind is that, you know, we're talking about kind of the influence between inside where it's warm and outside where it's cold, but you can also have some temperature gradients uh, in a room or in different parts of a house. And so, um, you know, this is where you kind of would geek out quite a bit, but if you've got like a wood stove, I encourage you to um, get like a little piece of tissue paper or something like that um, and hold it up, up high in a doorway and down low in a doorway with um, uh, a room that might have a wood stove or another big heat source. And what you'll probably see is some convective air currents, cold air coming in down low and warm air escaping up high. So same sort of concept as the whole house, except it's happening inside the house. And the same thing can happen if you've got windows and outside walls that are gonna be colder, kind of cooling that air and um, causing the air currents to uh, the air to drop. And then same, sort of concept in reverse with a wood stove, warming the air, making it more buoyant. It's kind of funny that Ted and I, um, I'm, I'm at Lakes Region Community College and I used to be energy auditor, auditor and did uh, energy uh, weatherization installations. And now I, I train energy auditors and do other energy training type work. And it's amazing how many times probably Ted and I both have heard people say, well, you know, you really need to check our windows because they're very leaky. And then we use the blower door to, to test for air leakiness. And we find that eh, windows actually, you know, they're pretty well sealed. And so probably what's happening is that people are experiencing these convective air currents inside their house. And they think that's their windows leaking when really their windows just um, are conducting that heat out and that coldness uh, from the windows not being great insulators causing the air to... Um, to have these, these little convective air currents. So here's kind of a great cutaway view um, of a house showing different spots for air leakage. And the best way to think about this is A, B, and C. Um, so both in terms of areas of air leakage and opportunities for air sealing. And so A is up in the attic and B is down in the basement and C the center of the building. Um, and so the biggest opportunities are going to be up in the attic and then the next highest is down in the basement and really not a whole lot of opportunities in the center of your house. Um, particularly if you have what's called a flat attic like this example where there's just a lot of connections, little cracks, holes, things like that between that top floor and the attic area. So a couple examples along those lines. These are things kind of up in the attic that are typical sources of air leakage. So I'll just go through the, the pictures here. The one at the top, top right, is an example of like a, um, a light uh, in, inside a box. And you can see kind of the little white dots glowing. And those are basically just little holes. Uh, and if you notice carefully, we've kind of accentuated this a little bit with uh, the red arrows, but uh, what you see, the staining on the insulation is, is real and it's very common in attics. And what that is, is actually the, the fiberglass insulation, what we call filter glass, is actually catching dust from months, if not years of air leakage. And it uh, tends to darken from all that dust that's caught from all that air leakage. And so same sort of concept with the, um, the middle photo uh, down at the, the bottom. Those are the, basically what we're looking at there is what's called a top plate. And that's the, the boundary between um, an interior wall and the attic. 
and you think, well, interior wall, no big deal, but actually it, it's, it's another kind of highway for air leakage because there's some cracks there that allow air to leak out. And this is an old style, the, the lower left is an old style ceiling can light that has a lot of holes, a lot of air leakage. And then the lower right is kind of a super highway for air leakage. And that's the several inch gap around a chimney called a chimney chase. And that tends to go all the way down to the basement and up high. And because of that buoyancy of warm air it tends to really leak a lot of air. So we're going to try here a poll on you to see if you're following along. And this is about this pegboard attic hatch. So it's a pegboard attic hatch, and it's got 16 inches of fiberglass insulation on top of it. And is that assembly a good way to prevent uh, heat loss in the winter? So it's, you know, it's, you only have two possibilities here. Yes, it's good. And no, it's not so good. So we'll give you a little bit of time. To, uh, to vote. So talking about an attic hatch with some holes in it, but it's got a lot of insulation on top of it. Wow, what a great group here. Uh, that's excellent. Um, we've had, believe it or not, we've had some button up groups where the majority of people say, yeah, that sounds pretty good to me. Um, so clearly you folks are on top of things. It's, you know, the insulation is good, uh, 16 inches, that's great, but all those holes, not so good. And, um, you know, this is kind of an extreme example, but there's amazing amount of examples in houses that, uh, that we find, you know, can even be things like built-in shelving that kind of goes into a wall that goes up to an attic or, or just all sorts of things that are kind of funky. So that was up in the attic. Uh, also worth going after air leakage in the basement. And kind of the big opportunities are most likely associated with um, the, uh, the boundary between the foundation and the frame part of the house. What's called the rim joist or box sill area, sill plate. Um, there can be a fair amount of leakage there. And then any sort of like uh, doors, bulkheads, things like that, that might be going from the basement to outside. And just like uh, the example that we just did the poll for, just putting up fiberglass in that uh, rim joist area, that photo with the X, is not um, a great idea. That, that helps in terms of insulation, but first, and same in the attic as well as the basement, first do the air sealing and then add some insulation and install it well. So in the center of the house, there's, there's some opportunities if you have a fireplace. A lot of them have flues that don't seal all that well. And so there's ways to go after that. You can put in something called a chimney balloon that helps to uh, seal around um, a fireplace that's not being used. Um, a lot of windows really are pretty good shape, but a few types of windows, kind of the older pulley hung windows, might have a fair amount of air leakage. And... Um, a lot of the doors are fairly bowed in one way or another, and this material that you see the photo of in the lower photo is called Culon. It's a good retrofit weather strip material that would go on the outside of the, the door to help kind of go after places where there'd be cracks um, with exterior doors. Uh, and Ted's going to be talking more about um, air sealing strategies, but I want to just kind of give you a little bit, a scoop about, you know, you might be thinking, oh, I really don't want to seal up my house too much and, you know, I need oxygen to breathe, think that kind of thing. Um, the typical home in New Hampshire is, is more leaky than it should be in terms of air leaks. So there's a lot of opportunities, not in every home, but in many homes. Uh, and that can be tested with a blower door. And so that blower door measures air leakage and Ted will be talking about that in a little bit. Um, and there's, there's standards as well about what's the right amount of airflow. So it's comfortable, but not too outrageous. I just saw um, a blurb about how, um, how we need to put in more humidifiers uh, because of COVID this winter, because COVID spreads more in drier air. 
one of the benefits of having a house that has kind of the right amount of air sealing is that it keeps the humidity in because that cold air that's leaking in from outside is very, very dry air. So you basically get kind of nosebleed dry conditions with a lot of air leakage in a house. And so in my opinion, humidifier is not necessarily a great idea, particularly if you don't know where all that humidity is going. You don't want it to go up into an attic and create all sorts of moisture problems up there. But doing air sealing um, can actually increase uh, the humidity and make it just more pleasant, comfortable environment to be in, in addition to, to warmer. And so moisture is a big deal and a good energy auditor is gonna pay attention to moisture, particularly humidity, but also sources of moisture. So we don't really have time to get into a lot of detail here, but you know things like dirt basements and crawl spaces, um, air leakage into the attic, you know that is an avenue for moisture to get into the attic. And so that's, that's very important to control that. Um, and certainly bathroom fans that are taking that moisture away when people taking a shower or bathing and getting it all the way to outside. Not putting it into the attic, but getting, it, getting that moisture all the way to outside. And so um, one of our adages with weatherization is seal tight and ventilate right. And what we mean there is mechanical ventilation. So in, in other words, um, use these mechanical devices like a bathroom fan or the one over on the right, a heat recovery ventilator to um, get the right amount of mechanical ventilation, whether it's exhaust mechanical ventilation with the bathroom fan or what we call balanced mechanical ventilation with this heat recovery ventilator that exhausts out stale air uh, and then it brings in fresh air and it has a heat exchanger in the middle of it to allow the warmth of that stale air in the wintertime to heat up the cold air that's coming in. So you can have a house that's really, really well air sealed and with a heat recovery ventilator, just kind of measure out just the right amount of, of fresh air in the house. So it makes it very comfortable, maintains the humidity well and saves energy. All right, we're not doing a poll for this one, but just kind of a little quiz here for you. What's, what's the biggest factor that's causing all the ice dams with this house? And this is pretty, pretty extreme here. Um, you know, usually ice dams aren't quite this bad. They might have even gotten water that gets down into the exterior walls and causing damage along those lines. But it's essentially whenever you see icicles more than, oh, you know, uh, half a foot or a foot or so, oftentimes there's some heat loss associated with the house. And the biggest factor that was causing ice dams with this house is the air leakage. You know, it wasn't lack of insulation. It was actually a fair amount of insulation with the house, but a lot of air leakage. And so, you know, really important, if you do have ice dams, to be doing things like getting a blower door test, um, understanding where the air leakage might be, as well as adding insulation. And I think uh, we're at the point here of, uh, transitioning back over, right? Um, we are. So let me stop my screen share. And any questions that people have about this section? All right, thanks Andy. So hopefully you guys picked up a bunch of things there in terms of you know how heat moves in buildings and what the biggest issues are and um, it's funny, you know, we can never promise anybody that we can get rid of their ice dams um, because sometimes you have houses, like I said, that, uh, or like Andy mentioned, that um, will always have an ice dam no matter what. But if it's, if it's a heated building, uh, most likely that ice dam is being you know, predominantly caused by heat loss. So if you do something to reduce the energy bills in that house, it's probably going to help with the ice dam situation too. I always get a, a kind of a laugh when I go to the hardware store sometimes in the wintertime and I see something like this out front, right? It's a big stack of 50 pound bags of salt. I mean, technically I suppose it's not false advertising um, because it is true that if you dump a bunch of salt on some ice, it is going to melt the ice. Um, but it's certainly not safe or easy to get up there with this, you know, big sack on your shoulder with your boots and your down park or going up a ladder. Uh, and it's really just putting a bandaid on a broken leg because next time it snows, you're going to be back in the same boat and you're going to have another ice dam because you really haven't gotten at you know, the root cause of the issue. So this is kind of a good emergency treatment 
um, but not really a long-term solution. You know, so by now you might be thinking, you know, maybe I need to get some help with this because, um, you know, this stuff is pretty complicated and it can be um, uh, helpful to get a comprehensive energy audit done by a home performance professional, somebody who does this, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis for a living. Um, rather than just kind of, you know, stabbing in the dark and, you know, take, taking guesses on your own. Um, if you get a full audit, you're, they're going to look at every single spot in your house. They're going to do tests on the combustion equipment, um, efficiency and safety tests. You're going to get a written report, so you'll be able to prioritize, you know, what should be done. You know, a lot of people know that their house needs work. They don't know exactly what kind of work or where the work should be done or what's the best order, what's the most important. And that's really, you know, one of the biggest benefits of getting an energy audit. Andy will talk more about um, you know, getting one of those through the New Hampshire Saves program at the end. One of the coolest tools that we use in most people's houses is a blower door. Blower door is basically a big fan that you put in the doorway, you close all the windows and doors, and then you suck all the air out of the house. So you depressurize the house and the air still comes in through the gaps and the cracks and the holes. So whatever's going through the fan is sort of how leaky the house is. So it's a really great way of sort of quantifying the air leakage and seeing, you know, how big, how bad of a problem is this. Um, you can also use it sometimes to actually find the air leakage. Um, you know, you can do things like look for stained fiberglass, like Andy showed in some of those pictures. Um, but sometimes there's some really hard to, to track down air leakage, and a blower door can help you do that. Uh, it also can be used, as Andy mentioned, to find out, you know, how tight is this house? Uh, what's the level of tightness where you have to start to worry about indoor air quality? Um, the only way to do that is to get a blower door. Um, we also use these usually at the end of a job to, you know, sort of confirm how much of a uh, reduction in air infiltration we achieved with all the work that was done. Infrared cameras can be really useful too. Um, they don't, they're not magical. They don't see through buildings or walls or things like that. Um, really, they, all they do is tell you the surface temperature of whatever it is you're looking at. So in this picture with the, with the home sign there on the wall, that was actually an interior wall of someone's house. And you can see there's a pretty significant difference in color between the HO and the ME. And that's because there's something going on in that wall um, to show that kind of a, a color difference. Um, the bottom left picture, ironically, was a house that was um, designed by an architect, um, not lived in by an architect anymore, lived in by a surgeon from up at Dartmouth. Um, but he had frozen pipes in two of his bathrooms. And uh, what you're looking at in that picture is all these freezing cold walls above his bathroom because of just a poor design of the house um, that caused that. And you can also use it to find you know, air leakage coming in because the, the, the color differences in the colors. So if you're gonna get you know, professional work done uh, or whether you're gonna do work yourself, you really need to kind of think about these, these priorities, the ABC, Attic Basement you know, Center. And the other priority or the other order that you need to keep in mind is that you wanna do the air sealing first and then you want to worry about the insulation. Um, in, in part, that's because air sealing is so crucial. Uh, but the other part of that is because imagine if you, um, you know, blew all the cellulose in this attic first, and then you just went in to try to do the air sealing. Very, very hard to do. It's a lot easier to do it first, uh, getting in there and sealing up all those things, and then adding the insulation. Ted, Ted, this yeah. is Renee. Can I interrupt you for a question? I have a uh, question. Go for it. You ready? Okay, so this is, it, there's a three-part question. Uh -huh. Should attic windows be cracked at the bottom and top all year long? Um, I'd say it kind of depends. I mean, if you're using those as like your only ventilation, um, probably would be a good idea in terms of letting out, you know, really hot air in the summer and also letting out moist air in the winter. But, you know, cracking a window in an attic oftentimes is not, um, not, a, not effective enough. Uh, it'll help a little bit, but it's not really, that's not what the window's designed for. Um, also, if you're opening up a window, I'm, I'm assuming that you have insulation on the floor of the attic and it's an unconditioned, you know, attic. Um, a lot of times people will try that in the winter and the wind blows and it blows snow in. And then they end up with, you know, eight inches of snow in their attic. And then when it melts, there's a problem. So um, it's not sort of a recommended strategy, but it could work in a pinch. Okay, question two. How should one seal around the attic floor when the chimney gap, where the chimney gap is? We're going to talk about that right now. 
Okay, then um, I'll skip to the next question. Should the door to the basement have a weather strip at the bottom? We're gonna talk about that too. Okay, and what type of caulking do you suggest? Latex, silicone, et cetera? Um, there's a lot of different considerations there, I suppose. It depends on you know how you want it to look and do you need to paint it? Um, so I think you just gotta read the fine print and make sure it meets all the, the, you know, the, the things that you, you need it to do. Um, flexibility is certainly a big thing in terms of being able to, you know, expand and contract. So I look at all those different factors. All right. That's, of, that's all the questions. So go ahead. In terms of yeah. the chimney on the bottom left here is a diagram of how a chimney, you know, ideally would be air sealed. It needs to be done with, with sheet metal and fire caulk because of fire code reasons. You would not want to get that little can of foam that you see in the top picture that's being used to seal up like um, lights and wire holes and penetration, things like that. Um, that would be an inappropriate way of you know, sealing up around a chimney. Um, and you can see there's also a dam there to keep the insulation away from the chimney. So there's a couple different considerations there, which is again, why, uh, another good reason why some people you know, decide something to you know, get a professional in to help with. This, this big picture here is kind of a hybrid approach um, this is a case where the homeowner wanted us to remove all their insulation because it was really old and nasty. It was full of, um, you know, mouse carcasses and feces and stuff. And then um, before we added in new fluffy, cost-effective, um, you know, insulation, cellulose, we just put two inches of spray foam down to completely air seal the whole entire attic floor all at once. Um, but spray foam is pretty expensive, so you wouldn't want to get all the way up to R50 or 60 with spray foam itself. You really only need an inch or two to do the air sealing, and then we added cellulose on top of that. So it's kind of a, you know, getting some air sealing with spray foam and then adding insulation on top of it. We spend quite a bit of time looking at the access holes in the attics, right? So if you have a drop down stair, whether you have a little hatch in your closet, um, you know, that should be insulated, not pegboard, uh, and it should have something uh, insulating it above that's not, you know, permeable to air. Um, and you, know, you can see these are all weather stripped really well to be super tight and insulated. You can see that top picture, there's a kind of a wooden barrier because this person you know, wanted to store some stuff in their attic. Um, the bottom picture is like a knee wall slope and a knee wall space in an older home. And that was um, you know, spray foamed with a few inches of spray foam. You can actually see some little round holes in the wood there, the last piece of wood along the wall, that's from um, dense packing underneath that floor. Because that spot in the inner floor cavity is often an area that gets overlooked or never gets insulated to start with. So pretty important to, uh, to make sure that gets done too. Moving on from attics, again, the, the second priority is basements. Uh, air sealing that basement is really important. And also um, in most cases, we're insulating the walls of the basement. Um, top left picture, the shiny picture is Thermax. That's a, a, a rigid foam board that we install on uh, this basement wall. Um, it's a lot more expensive than you know pink board or blue board that you might see around, but um, for fire code reasons, this is you know okay to leave exposed, um, and it works really well. If you have a um, a rough wall because it's brick or a rubble or thing like like the bottom picture on the right, uh, spray foam is really the only way to go there because rigid foam board is not going to you know line up against the wall like that. So you know each situation is a little bit different. Um, spray foam, that would have to be painted with an intumescent paint to meet the fire code. Um, so that's a little bit of cost, but it also you know, makes it a little safer. Uh, in terms of air sealing, a lot of times you know, you'll you have a pic situation like the bottom left, that's a little bit before and after picture. Um, you can actually kind of see the light coming in around the bulkhead there on the left-hand picture where the sta at the top of the stairs. Um, you know, those bulkhead doors are not designed to be airtight. They're only designed to sort of keep the water out. Um, but you'd be amazed at how many houses have, are set up like this, even in some newer houses. For some reason, there's no door there. So obviously, that's a place where you know cold air is getting pulled into the house, and at the same time, it's getting pulled in. That's part is pushing hot air out. So uh, the, the most cost-effective thing down there is to build a door in there, um, you know, out of plywood and hinges and two by fours and rigid foam board, and that works really well. It might not be the prettiest thing, but it's effective. Again, the center of the house really is not the priority because the because of the temperature and pressure differences. Um, the cold air is going to be coming in at the lowest point in the house and the warm air is going to be going in at the highest. In the center of the house, oftentimes there's not a whole lot going on, um, but there is some. So 
you know, chimney blooms can be a really good solution if you have an, a chimney uh, flyer place that you don't use much or at all. Um, get, Annie mentioned weather stripping. Um, and then this is kind of a, an example of, kind of a unique example where there was like a chimney in a closet and there was a huge gap along the side of that chimney. So a lot of the warm air was escaping up, you know, into that slope and into that cavity and up into the, uh, the attic. If you have empty walls, um, that's definitely a situation that you're going to want to get professional help with. Um, typically, those get done with dense pack cellulose, but the machine that blows cellulose that you might get at, say, Home Depot or Lowe's or something, um, that's not really designed for dense packing. It's designed to sort of just blow the loose stuff out into your attic. So um, the, the new machines that the contractors have are really capable of doing this. Um, and it's, uh, it's pretty complicated and it takes a lot of time. Um, we, we usually only try to do it if your walls are already completely empty. Uh, if you have a little bit of insulation in there already, it's a really hard to do a good job because that hose has to go in and up. Um, a lot of times in older houses, you'll find um, cross, break, uh, cross bracing or fire breaks and things like that. Um, so it can get kind of complicated, but um, you know, basically you pull off a little bit of siding, drill the hole, fill it up, put a, a plug in the hole, and then put the siding back on. Um, and a lot of times the older siding, people worry about the older siding usually comes off easier than a lot of the newer siding. Um, because they, they use beefier wood back then. Andy talked a little bit about windows. You know, hopefully there aren't any window salesmen, uh, you know, on the call today I'm, that we're going to offend, but, um, you know, they're almost never uh, a cost-effective energy improvement. Um, as Andy mentioned, they're always going to be the worst part of your house. Even if you spent top dollar, triple pane, argon-filled window from Canada or Germany, it's still going to be the worst part of your house. You know, so, so to spend a thousand dollars on you know six or eight square feet and have it only be a little bit better than it was before, then still have it be the worst part of your house. Not a very wise use of your money. Um, it's just the, it's just the nature of the windows, you know. And I, I've lived in a house with those kinds of windows. And if you sit in front of that window, it still feels a little cold. Um, so it's you know it's not like a silver bullet. Um, we talked a little bit about you know how air moves in a house too. If you have old leaky windows. A lot of times you can make them leak less by going up in the attic, you know, by air sealing in the attic and keeping the warm air in the house so it's not leaking, then that will slow down how much cold air is getting pulled in around the windows. So a lot of times people will think they need new windows. What really, they really need is a lot of air, attic air sealing. There's also a lot of things you can do to a window that'll improve it, you know, at a fraction of the cost. So if you do have a single pane window, if you put an interior storm in there at you know, 25% of the cost of a new window, you basically made a, a double pane window. So there's a lot of different things you can do, like, you know, you know win, window inserts and um, sailor shades and things like that. You know, if the, if the, if it's fogged up because the seal is shot or the condensation in there, or it's cracked and it won't open and shut, like those are, are decent reasons for um, replacing a window, but trying to, you know, make your house more energy efficient by replacing the windows that, you know, cost effective way is, uh, usually not going to happen. Uh, carbon monoxide, hopefully you know something about that. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a byproduct of every type of combustion. doesn't matter what, what you're burning. If you're burning anything, um, you're, you're getting carbon monoxide and hopefully it's going out the flue pipe and it's not, um, you know, making anyone sick or killing anybody, but it is odorless, tasteless, colorless. Um, so, we you know, highly recommend that everyone has at least one CO detector in their home, if not more than one, one per floor. Uh, each year, there's people that end up dying uh, in every state across the country because of malfunctions with water heaters or furnaces and boilers and things like that. So it's really important that you, um, you, know, you get help if there's any question at all about this. And uh, sometimes when you change the physics of a house by doing a bunch of air sealing, you can create a problem where you might have some backdrafting, like you see this picture here with this old water heater of carbon monoxide, you know, back into the home. So it'd be definitely something to be aware of. Heating systems often get really overlooked. Um, you know, people just, hey, it keeps working, so let's just keep it running. Um, but you really ought to have that tested and cleaned, you know, each year. Uh, it'll run better, it'll run safer. Um, doesn't matter what fuel you use, um, they, they should all be. Be looked at each year and the filters should be changed uh, it's crazy some of the, the conditions of some of the filters that you see um, it'll run you know much more uh, efficiently and much more healthy if you keep those filters uh, changed on a regular basis 
this is just kind of an example of a funny situation I had in Portsmouth a few years ago. Set up the blower door, cranked it up. We heard a big bang upstairs. And the homeowner said, what was that? And I said, oh, is it probably just your cat or something? She said, I don't have a cat. Uh, well, maybe it was a door. Because sometimes it'll actually open and, and close a door if there's enough air coming through that room. We went upstairs and looked around, and all the doors were shut or open still. So it wasn't a door closing. And we went in the bathroom, and I was like, whoa. The mirror in the bathroom was in the sink. It pulled it right off the wall because of the suction because I was pulling in air. And the reason was, if you look behind you, you can see there's a big gaping hole. And that hole went right into an attic, you know. And, uh, you know, the backstory is, okay, it was a flipped house from 1954. So there was probably like this ugly medicine cabinet in that hole there. And the flipper chucked it in the garbage can, or the, the dumpster, and then was like, okay, what should we do? Let's just get a, you know, a little $10 mirror and we'll put it up there with a the hook. And um, so that lady would have just sort of sat, sat there brushing her teeth each night, never real, realizing that all the warm air in her house was leaking out around that, that, um, that mirror into that room. Because even if she put her hand up there, she wouldn't feel that, right? But when I put the blower door on, I reversed the flow of the air and, and um, popped it right off there. Uh, the ice dams on that section of the house were really, really bad um, because that attic was probably you know, almost as warm as, as the bathroom. This is another kind of interesting example. Um, believe it or not, this is one of the worst houses I've ever been in. It was in the New Hampshire Saves Rebate Program, which is for the most inefficient houses in New Hampshire. Andy's gonna talk about that at the end. Um, I thought I was in the wrong house, so this can't be right. I mean, that's Lake Winnipesaukee in the background there. You can see the whole lake. Uh, I think it was about 5,000 square feet. You know, uh, really super expensive, really big. Uh, but it was the right problem. And they had a massive, massive, massive ice dam problem that they were struggling with. Um, so, you know, I said, well, okay, let's figure out what it is. And I went in and looked at beautiful, beautiful home. Um, they had a lot of recessed lights. So I pulled up the fiberglass and I saw, you could see the stains. So I'm like, okay, the recessed lights leak. Um, I ran a blower door. The blower door number was off the charts. And I said, you know what? It's not just the recess lights. There's got to be something else. There's something big here that's making, you know, and I checked all the windows and doors twice because I thought maybe I left the window open. Um, so I thought to myself, well, what's different about this house? This is sort of interior pictures. Um, you know, this, this could be on like a, a coffee table book of the late, you know, finest lakefront homes of New Hampshire. Um, and the only thing I could really see that was different was the lighting, right? So there's lighting around there. You see the shelf lighting. Now, normally shelf lighting is, um, it's like a shelf that's just, you know, bolted or screwed onto the wall. Then there's a shop light or something up there with a really beautiful board out here so you don't see the light and it shines up and it makes a cool effect. Don't see that very often in people's homes. So I thought, well, maybe that's part of the problem. So I got my ladder and put it up there and looked over the top of the, the piece of wood there um, and was kind of shocked to see that, you know, Andy was talking about little quarter inch cracks before being problematic. The shelf was made out of two by fours that came out of the wall. And I, so I could take a video with my camera in their living room and then take my whole arm in that hole and take a video in the basement and then print it out and look at it. So the, the gap was actually three and a half inches high. And then in between each thing is about 15 inches wide. But if you look at this house, I mean, they had 125 feet of shelf light, which means they had a hole three and a half inches high by 125 feet long open into their attic. And, you know, and that, that's worse than leaving a couple windows open all winter long. Because if you leave your windows open, obviously you're wasting fuel and energy and money, but your heat at least is just kind of blown into the backyard. In this case, they had the equivalent of several open windows to the attic. So all the warm air in the house was just escaping into the attic and the furnace is running all the time trying to keep up. But the more heat it produces, the more it goes up into the attic. So it was pretty obvious. No wonder they have an ice dam problem. Um, they also had two furnaces in the attic, which, you know, again, it's a whole nother story, but can't do much about that. That is what it is. Not a very good place to put an attic, uh, a, a furnace in New Hampshire. Um, but you can see, you know, this house had a lot of roof line. And um, in fact, he was spending, I think, ten or $15,000 a year um, putting crews of people up on top of this roof to shovel the ice and snow off every time it snowed. Because if he didn't, um, it would start backing up onto the shingles and you could see how beautiful these slopes are, but it, that was all kind of falling in in big, huge, wet clumps of sheetrock from the ice dam problems. So to keep that from happening, he had to hire people every snowstorm to get up there and shovel. So, you know, if you're feeling bad about your house or your energy bills, you know, don't feel so bad. These people paid over, you know, a million and a half dollars or something for this house and the sheetrock is falling in from the ice dams. Um, 
yeah, again, there's just sort of a picture of the shelf light. You can see where the two by fours are in this huge gap there. Um, ironically, um, somebody had come along a year or two before that and said, oh, you got ice dams. We know what ice dams are from. Ice dams are from heat in your attic. You got too much heat in your attic. We got to get rid of the heat in your attic and then you won't have any ice dams. So what do you think they did? They cut four or five holes into this beautiful roof and put those turbine vents up there that will spin and suck all the air out of the attic. But what they didn't realize, because they didn't run a blower door, is that most of the warm air in the attic was coming from the house. So when they put these turbine vents in, yeah, they did suck all the warm air out of the attic, but it sucked even more warm air from the house into the attic through that three and a half inch by 125 foot crack. So uh, the bills didn't go down uh, and the ice dams didn't really get any better because of this. So there's a lot of um, you know, people out there that are really looking at the whole picture. Um, and not not using some of this really cool equipment that we have out there to diagnose these things. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Andy's going to start. He's going to talk he, to you guys about the New Hampshire Saves program and all the benefits of that and how that can help you get some. I think we have a little out. little uh, change of pace here, and this is I okay. think where Amy's going to talk about oh. heat pumps. Okay. So I'll stop my share and. Okay, well, thank you both. Um, so I wanted to talk for a few minutes about heat pumps and I'm not sure how many of you know about them or have seen them. Um, I apologize, I'm right near the train tracks. So my dog's not barking, but you could probably hear the train. <laughs> um, so this is a heat pump behind me. This is the indoor unit. Um, so a heat pump is essentially, you have an outdoor unit and an indoor unit. Um, you can have multiple indoors off of one outdoor, but I don't know if I can share my screen, but I wanted to show this. Can you guys see this? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Okay, yeah. so this is, this is the outdoor unit here. So it looks like a big box fan. You may have seen it on, on the outside of people's homes, on restaurants, um, outside stores, but they're really popular in, in Japan and in Asia, um, Europe. You know, if you've traveled, you've seen them. Even down south, you'll see them a lot. So they're kind of newer to our country, but, but they're getting more popular um, as time goes on, especially with new construction. But they also have applications for retrofit situations. So essentially what this is doing is it's a closed loop of refrigerant. So inside here is refrigerant that is in a closed loop that comes up into these indoor units and then back down. So this unit here is pulling heat from the air outside. Um, this, tip, this specific brand right here is Mitsubishi Hyperheat. <clears throat> and this one can actually get heat down to negative 13 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's pretty nice, it heats up this refrigerant that is then sent through this piping up to the indoor unit where a fan blows over the hot coils, the heat goes into your house, the refrigerant cools down, conden you know, it uh, condenses and goes back down to the outdoor unit and starts all over again. So it's this loop that's continuously happening. There's no combustion. So it's, it's much more efficient than something that, that has combustion. It's not burning fossil fuels, except for the electricity, of course, that you're using. But it is about two and a half times more efficient than electric radiant baseboard heat. So the reason we like them is because they're versatile. Um, they're efficient, they're versatile. You can zone the spaces in which they live. So you know, you put one in your living room, you put one in your bedroom, you know, you can choose different temperatures for each one. Um, and it does AC as well. So a lot of folks will do maybe one or two indoor units. Um, a pretty efficient way to start out if this is something you're interested in is to do like the kitchen in the living room or, or you know, the spaces that you use the most on the first floor. So if you can do one indoor unit there on the first floor and maybe one, let's say, in the master bedroom. A lot of people start that way. Um, and that way they're, they're using about, you know, let's say 75% less oil or natural gas or however else you're heating. B 
because you're really, you're cooling all summer with this thing and then you're using it to heat in the winter, uh, in the shoulder seasons. You're using it to heat the spaces that you're, you're spending the most time in. So in new construction, we see this, um, we'll see people doing them in every room or, you know, because in new construction, the homes are built so much tighter now, you can do fewer indoor units and, and sort of get away with fewer BTUs getting pumped into the home. Um, but with older homes, you, you will need more. So, you know, I, I work for a company that installs them and, and the way that we sort of look at the design is we take, you know, the square footage of the house or the room that you want to condition and we take into account the insulation and the weatherization that you have going on there. So we want to learn a lot about what's in the attic, what's in the basement, what are the windows like, the doors, um, when was the house built? That's often a, you know, if you don't know a lot about what's, what insulation you have in your walls, giving us the age of your house gives us some idea. Uh, but then that helps us figure out how many BTUs you need. So that's sort of the, the demand of the house. So we do, you know, one outdoor that has the total amount of BTUs you need. So if you're doing two indoor units like this one right here, you know, this, this one that's going into the first floor may be, let's say, an 18,000 BTU unit. So that's for a large space on the first floor. And let's say there's one going up to a master bedroom that's a lot smaller, let's say a 6,000 BTU unit. So this outdoor is the combination of two. It's, so it's probably gonna be a 24,000 BTU unit. Um, but so that's, you know, like I said, that's covering your heat and your AC um, for a lot of the year. We, we definitely recommend that you keep a backup source of heat um, for this. You know, you, you don't wanna get a few of these and just take your boiler right out. You will probably need some backup in the coldest times of the year. So whether that's two months or three months, you know, you, you certainly will need some backup, but it's a nice, efficient way to get off um, air conditioning, you know, the window units and, and become more efficient there and um, use, a, use less fossil fuels. So the company I work for is Revision Energy and we, we install solar. So these pair nicely with solar and that's sort of how we got into it. We wanted to, um, you know, allow people to get to net zero or try to get to net zero. We wanted to make sure we were allowing people to use less fossil fuels. And so these heat pumps are great, um, but they are only as clean as the source of the energy that's behind them. So powering them with solar is, is a great idea, but not certainly not necessary. You know, they're just, people have them that don't have solar. They just we're, we wire them right into the main electric panel and they run right off, you know, your electricity like, like anything else. But because they're efficient, they are eligible for rebates. So there are some rebates through New Hampshire Saves. Um, right now it's about $400 per ton. And it's based on the cooling capacity of a unit, but a ton would be a 12,000 BTU unit. So you'd get about $400 back for for a 12,000 BTU. So that's essentially the rundown. I mean, not everyone loves the way they look. I understand that they, they make floor units as well and they're not quite as in your face when you walk in a room. Um, so some people like that better, they're, they're low, they're smaller. Um, there's also ceiling cassette units. So, you know, they're up in the ceiling which is difficult in a retro situation to install those, not impossible, but uh, a little more work just to cut out holes in your ceiling and put it up there. And, you know, you got to consider the insulation in the attic at that point as well. Um, there's a condensate drip that comes out of each indoor unit because it is pulling humidity out of the room. So you need to make sure there's somewhere for that to go. Um, and lastly, you know, we, they also make a, a heat pump water heater. So same technology as these heat pump units, but uh, on top of a hot water heater. So it's an electric hot water heater, but uses about a third to a half of what a straight electric tank uses. 
and Ted had that um, list earlier about what appliances in your home use the most electricity. And so sort of if, if you have an electric hot water heater that I would say switching to a heat pump water heater would be a low hanging fruit for you. It's, it's not a huge expense and it pays itself off pretty quickly. Um, so also dehumidifies the basement as it works. So it needs a lot of space to breathe. You know, you want to, can't stick it in a closet. It needs to have access to a lot of air, but it's, it's pulling in the heat from your attic and it's, it's uh, heating the hot water that way, but dehumidification is sort of just a, a bonus of how it works. So if you're interested in that, um, I don't know how we're gonna sort of, maybe I'll put my name or my email address somewhere in the comments, or maybe Renee can do that, but that's what I wanted to give you a little spiel about heat pumps. So let me know if anyone has questions. No, I think we're good. All right, I'll, uh, I'll do the share screen. That's, that's a good segue into uh, what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, let's get these slides here. So, uh, thank you, Amy, that, that was great. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that is gonna be a bigger and bigger trend, not just with new construction, but also even with existing homes, is this whole idea of net zero. And, you know, another way to kind of think about it in terms of what we've been talking about is reduce then produce. You know, try to make your home as energy efficient as possible. So things like air sealing and insulation and pipe insulation, things like that. Um, and then produce uh, the energy that you need through solar panels. And then particularly if you've got a heat pump for heating and cooling, as well as a heat pump hot water heater, um, you know, you're kind of all set. And if, if I was to build a new house these days, I would definitely kind of go that route. And one of the things like Ted was mentioning that um, there's that whole combustion safety aspect of burning something and just getting away from burning fossil fuels, burning anything is real benefit on kind of multiple levels. So it's a trend actually that the utilities are gonna be supporting more. They've got a new 2021 to 2023 sort of plan that's uh, just in the process of getting approved by the Public Utilities Commission. And uh, I think you'll see some more initiatives along those lines in terms of uh, net zero. And so I've got a slide coming up about heat pumps, but I think Amy pretty much covered it. This is just kind of an overview with the NHSA's program. So we're talking about Unitil, Eversource, uh, New Hampshire Electric Co-op, as well as Liberty Utilities, and talking about both um, electric as well as natural gas. I think there's some parts of Exeter that have natural gas. So kind of depending on what you have, um, there's various different incentives that are available. And I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about all these different things. I'm gonna emphasize this last one, the home performance with Energy Star that kind of relates to a lot of the slides that we've been um, talking about tonight. Um, but just a couple other things worth, worth mentioning, those cold climate heat pumps. You know, definitely worth another look if you think that heat pumps only going to work down to 20 degrees or so because these new heat pumps really are amazing in terms of producing really useful heat at, you know, zero degrees, even less than zero degrees. And like Amy mentioned, the heat pump hot water heaters haven't really taken off, but they, you know, they deserve a look as well. And there's some good rebates associated with them. Um, if you do have natural gas, there's various incentives associated with that. And that's both for heating the house as well as hot water. And then there's things like smart thermostats that could be associated with those heat pumps and natural gas that there's incentives for. And definitely be on the lookout the next couple of months for some new programs along these lines associated with um, the New Hampshire Saves uh, utility efficiency programs. And just like um, Amy was talking about, it's pretty amazing how these heat pumps work. They're, they're in essence extracting heat 
in the summertime from your warm house to cool it down, same way the refrigerator works. And then they're extracting heat out of cold air and they can do it pretty efficiently to heat your home. They're basically kind of concentrating that heat that you might not think there's much of on a zero degree day, but there is enough through, um, through the technology that they have. So I wanna move on. There's, there's also programs for new construction, some great programs there. There's some um, financing incentives. There's a lot of good programs for commercial buildings as well. So worth checking out the nhsaves.com website. But I wanna emphasize just a little bit more and we're, we're getting pretty close to the end of the slides and then we'll open it up for uh, questions as well. Um, but um, a lot of the stuff that uh, Ted and I have been talking about, the insulation and the air sealing, and even things like um, LED light bulbs, uh, that can be part of a package of energy efficiency improvements with this home performance with Energy Star program. And the way that you qualify, um, it could be your own home, it could be part of a condo complex, could even be a, a rental unit associated with the landlord, but whichever, basically go through this process of figuring out the home heating index, which I'll talk about in just a minute. And if you do qualify, get a home energy audit that's pretty comprehensive, you know, includes things like the blower door test to measure air leakage, uh, typically includes an infrared camera scan, definitely includes combustion safety analysis for, for any fuels, you know, looking at carbon monoxide, both in the house as well as in the flue gases. That's about a $400, $450 audit and only costs $100. And the net cost is actually zero because that $100 becomes credit towards any work that's done. And the utilities will pay for 50% of the eligible energy improvements up to a utility contribution of $8,000. That's actually an increase from this year uh, to next year. And there's a chance that they might even up that utility contribution as well, but it looks like it's gonna be somewhere around 50%. And the nice thing too, is that they have oftentimes no interest financing that's available for the part that you do have to pay. So even in terms of just kind of paying off the, that part, um, you know, typically those payments are going to be less than the, uh, the savings that you're getting. And after a couple of years, that's all paid off and you've got a much more comfortable home, oftentimes a more durable home, uh, and certainly less fewer um, lower heating costs and it increases the resale value as well. So there's a lot of benefits with it. So you might be wondering, how do I qualify for this program? Um, go to the nhsaves.com and there's an energy audits and weatherization section under the, the residential part. And there's a little tab that says test your home. Uh, got the arrow there. And um, so this is an example, 2000 square foot home. That's one of the things that you need to enter. If you don't know um, what's the heated area of your home, you can take a look at your town assessor information for your home. And then you just put in your zip code and your electric utility. And then probably the, the, tri the hardest part is figuring out what is um, a year's worth of heating fuels uh, consumption. And they are gonna ask to verify that information, like get receipts of oil deliveries, or could even be taking a picture of your wood pile or something like that. Um, so it, um, at least to participate in the program, you've gotta have that sort of information. In this example, 2000 square foot house, uh, 800 gallons of heating oil, not a huge amount, but a decent amount. And then two full cords of wood being used. And for a house like that, it would score a little over nine uh, on the home heating index. The bad news is that's not the most efficient house in terms of BTUs per square foot of heating, heating fuel. The good news is it, it qualifies for this home performance with Energy Star program. So basically scores of eight or higher qualify. And in 2021, or if you've got Liberty Utilities Natural Gas or Unitil Natural Gas, um, there's other ways to qualify. Some other programs are probably gonna be coming out, but this will still be kind of the main um, way to qualify for these weatherization programs like this. So um, we're pretty much at the end here, and I know we've got a little few minutes left, but now be the time to do a little 
poll again of what you're planning on doing uh, after this presentation. So this is one where you don't have to pick just one. You can pick all of them if you want. But uh, some things that we've been talking about were things like taking a closer look at uh, your electric and other energy bills. You know, I, I should add in there looking into installing a cold climate heat pump like Amy was talking about, but also installing LED light bulbs uh, and other energy saving items finding out if you qualify for the New Hampshire Saves Home Performance with Energy Star program. Uh, maybe even if you're gung-ho, uh, going up in your attic and looking for signs of air leakage, hopefully wearing a good uh, like N95 mask and uh, skin eye protection, things like that, if you're going up there to do some digging around. And then, you know, maybe you're looking at uh, seeking out a home energy performance professional, which utilities or um, if you need advice about where to go to kind of look for lists. The, the longer um, button up presentation has a little bit more details there than, than what we had. So great. Um, great that uh, a lot of you folks want to try out different things. And yeah, the Home Performance with Energy Star program, it's a great program. Um, you know, it's, it's the utilities kind of putting their name behind it. So they want to make sure that the contractors are doing a good job. And it's both kind of that assessment as well as getting the work done. So I strongly encourage you to, um, to take a look at that. And I guess we'll, we'll open it up for questions, allow people to turn their mics on. And also got basically one more slide. There's some more slides that we have that probably won't show. But this has our uh, contact information if you want to get hold of us. The Pere Plymouth Area Renewable Energy Initiative website, uh, PlymouthEnergy.org, has a copy of the presentation. And we made one available to um, Renee as well if people want to get a copy of it. It'll be a slightly different one on the Pere website because it'll be the longer version, but um, has a few more slides to it. Okay, well, while we're waiting for some questions to come through, um, I will send the uh, presentation as a PDF on an email to everybody that I sent the link to, which I think was all of the attendees tonight. In addition, I'll send Amy's uh, information over in case you want to talk to her about heat pumps. And uh, I don't see any other questions. And one of the things, Andy, I saw um, on your slide there that the utilities are giving a 50% rebate up to $8,000. In 2021, yeah, it's been yeah, $4,000 because... and they're upping it in 2021. Yeah, my gosh. There's some rumor well, I, that I... it might even be better than a 50% cost share, but no official announcement yet. Well, when I did this, uh, I did it myself here at the house maybe six years ago. I attended a button up in another town, and that's why I brought it to this town, because I thought it was great. So we had the blower door test, and um, at that point, the rebates were up to $4,000. So this yeah, is kind so, of a doubling. So they yeah, were, the utilities really are really going for, for it. Those, yeah, bigger projects and things like that. Mm. And. Uh, I almost don't want to mention it, but there's been for a few months was a 90% cost share where they're trying to make up for kind of lost time due to COVID. Uh -huh. uh, but that is unfortunately pretty much over now. Okay. All right. Um, and I see a question here from Richard. Uh, yes, I will send that information for the revision energy person. Her name was Amy Farnham. So I will send that to you in the email, uh, which I sent you the link on earlier. All right, anybody else for a question? All right, well, we're coming up on 825, so this is the perfect timing, you guys. Um, thank you, Andy, and thank you, Ted and Amy, and uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. I hope you go forward and get your energy audit and your blower door test and uh, start saving some energy. And if you want to share this, we're, we recorded the video so you can watch it on Exeter TV or we'll post it online if anyone wants to share with people who couldn't attend. So we'll make it available through the Energy Committee. So I'm sure they'll get that out as well. Sure, I'll send that as well. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Okay, bye everybody. Thanks. Have a good night.